Good day, doctors. Welcome to this second online learning experience from the UP Dental Alumni Association. In behalf of UPDAA, we would like to thank the UP Dental Alumni, the UPCD faculty, and the Dear Dentists from Our Official Pain Association of the Philippines, who incidentally is our web host for today. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. You asked and we listened. So now we are giving you the lectures that you, the topic that you requested from the last webinar. We will give it to you in updated version, but we will give it to you shortly. Just a few reminders, please make sure to turn off your videos and your uh, microphones. And you may use the chat box on Zoom and the Facebook live comments for your questions. Any other questions that we may not be able to tackle today, please email them at the updaa at gmail.com. Lastly, please do not forget to answer the evaluation form you submitted to us, as this would help us in improving our services. Thank you once again for joining us. Let us learn, all learn together. I turn you over now to my co-moderator and our VP, Dr. Monica C. Santiambao. Good morning, everybody. So after going through several clinical guidelines of the new norm, there has also been so much discussion about aerosols in the dental operatory. And with all the new information coming out, we need to put everything we have read or heard all together while we are preparing our clinics and ourselves to go back to work. So this is our topic for today's webinar, Up in the Air, Demystifying Dentistry in the New Norm. First, let me introduce our speaker for today. He is a graduate of the UP College of Dentistry, Batch 1990 and is presently the head of the Dentistry and Oral Surgery Services at St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City. He is also a clinical assistant professor at UPCD and the program director of the UPTMB and Orofacial Pain Program. He is also currently a volunteer of the UPPGH Bayanihan. So dear colleagues, good morning. Our speaker for today is the man of mystery, <laughs> Dr. Ricardo Buancan. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. Thank you for that unexpected introduction. Rochelle, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Monica, Michael, the rest of the UPDA, and I see in the, uh, there are particip so many participants here in Zoom and I guess on Facebook. Some are my teachers. One particularly stands out, Dr. <laughs> Angela Gonzalez. And of course, my uh, best friend. I have two best friends in class because they're still Okay. So one from Boston and one from uh, San Juan. San Juan ba? Mariposa. Okay. So anyway, um, the topic is timely. And maybe some of you have heard my, um, my topic. Uh, in the past PDA webinar, but I've updated this. So let me just share my screen. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. Thank you, UPDA, for uh, inviting me. As I said, I see some teachers, former students, and my classmates, my batchmates watching from across uh, in the US. And I hope you gain something from this. What I've learned over the last three, four months that this has been going on, I put together based on what you know we've read, uh, my experiences in, in the hospital, including perhaps information I gathered from the people in the hospital who are involved in infectious diseases. So this is not a repeat of any previous uh, seminar on webinar on aerosols. Rather, I put together something almost new entirely, but not totally. Uh, new information, and I suppose because there's so much panic going on with regard to aerosols, I decided to do a little tempering of that panic because you know panic isn't good; it, it can paralyze you. So let me share my, my my screen and start. When we talk about aerosols, we generally perceive of procedures in dentistry that are that of course generate all these gases, uh, gases and suspended particles, particularly in 
doing preps and doing your your ultrasonic scaling, piezo, piezo scaling, and and similar other things, including maybe uh, suctioning procedures. So what's what is what is the current current knowledge with regard to aerosol? Uh, not only it's not only in dentistry, but also medicine has procedures that generate aerosol. So what are the objectives of this scribe how to minimize risk of infection based on the hierarchy of controls? I'll show you the hierarchy of controls. Distinguish between aerosols and droplets. Is there really a distinction? Uh, describe what is known about aerosols and droplets based infections, based on our experiences with other diseases, because we don't have as much experience with COVID-19 as we do with influenza, tuberculosis, SARS-1, the other previous infections, and also rationalize the use of devices, equipment, and procedures to mitigate aerosol contamination. So it's a very broad lecture, but I'm going to try to keep it short so that we have a better, uh, better interaction during question and answer. Uh, by the way, special mention, I, I see Dr. Joel Gutierrez is uh, uh, watching as well, and um, I believe Dr. Joel Gutierrez did one of the first um, papers in, in the college on aerosols. Uh, back in 1970, and Joel, sorry, okay, but uh, he did a, one study in aerosols, so that's significant. Okay, so what is a hierarchy of controls? The hierarchy of controls basically is six steps based on, this is based on the RITM. So elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative practices, PPE. For elimination, we already kind of uh, are practicing that, or at least the recommendations already show us that for us to eliminate the hazard, we need to do telescreening or remote screening of our patients prior to any kind of appointment. Now, the screening process is done remotely, but I suggest you also do your screening process when the patient comes into the office because it is not common for, especially our colleagues in the US, for you to do remote screening and appoint the patient the next day. I know uh, practices there are quite robust and fast so when we have our when we have when you have your practices, I know that appointments are made a few days in advance. What are these screening questions? Of course, uh, symptoms, because there are a lot of what we call pre-infection symptoms that are not recognized by patients. So you probably have to delineate this. Even mild sore throat, we call anosmia and hypogesia, meaning decreased sense of smell and taste. Perhaps a bout of lethargy or weakness and. Usually, when you do your appointment screenings, as I said, a few days before your appointment, three to five days, fortunately for us, most of the studies coming out now in May show that symptoms come out within three to five days of infection. So a follow-up uh, screening might want to be done with patients prior the day before the appointment to make sure that they have not developed symptom symptoms since the last screening. Okay, what about substitution? Substitution or replacing the hazard? Well, obviously we cannot do that because th these are our patients. We don't, of course, appoint patients who are symptomatic. So we, we kind of uh, do that. We, we know that already. But there are some cases where we, we might have to treat patients who are positive for symptoms. And I'll go into a little bit more detail as to what procedures may be done for that. But what we do is we do mitigate, mitigating uh, procedures like probably pre-procedural mouth rinses. You know, you can choose from a host of, of many things like our, I believe our sponsor for today has their own povidone iodine preparations, chlorine dioxide. And then you also have your 1% uh, hydrogen peroxide, cetopyridinium, chloride. You can choose from a host of these. The important thing is to remember when it comes to controlling infection with regard to mouthwashes or even disinfection of surfaces, is that you have to consider contact time. So, you know, patient, tell the patient to probably not, not necessarily gargle, but soak the mouth in, in, in a disinfectant mouth, mouth rinse for maybe 30 seconds if they can hold it. What about engineering? Well, you do ventilation controls and isolation rooms if possible, for, especially for infected patients. And when it comes to administrative work or controls, we, we already have to know the workflow of our clinics what to do when a patient comes in, uh, who stays in the, in the uh, wait, uh, reception room, who stays in the uh, treatment room, the, the wait 
the way your staff moves, where clean and contaminated areas are. You have to draw that in a floor plan and go to your office and outline it. No? And then, of course, practicing distancing when it comes to even among your staff members, especially during mealtimes. What about practices? Well, you know, we, we, there, a lot of things have been said about donning and doffing. There's so many videos out there. I uh, would encourage you to watch and practice in real time. Get your PPEs and practice along with the video and practice with your staff along with the videos. Of course, instrument preparation and sterilization uh, is important. Preparation meaning where do you, whereas before you kept your instruments within reach in the operatory, even instruments you won't be needing for your procedures, now you probably have to get them out and put together entirely entirely different area for instrument preparation. And of course, environmental cleaning and disinfections, all part of practices. And then the last is, of course, if you notice, among the hierarchy of uh, controls, it's only it's the PPE, which is last. So that's your last resort. Okay? And I'm not going to talk much about PPEs today. I think that's been uh, talked about a lot already. Okay, so let's do the distinction between droplets and aerosols. Aerosols are basically solid or liquid particles that are suspended in gas or air in the case of our offices. Most aerosols actually are not visible to the naked eye. That means they are smaller than 10 microns. If you see my pointer, this is a particle that's 10 microns, a red blood cell seven, and you go down all the way to uh, viral particles. Uh, they say coronavirus can be as small as 0.1 microns. And all of these you cannot see with your naked eye. So if you look at studies done with dyes in aerosols, and you see splat splatter all over the operator's face shield, mask, etc., and on the patient's chest and face, those are droplets that are probably bigger than 10 microns. Okay, so anything smaller than that is probably ga gas gaseous or gasified or aerosolized, and you can't see those. Now, if you look at the one on the right side, that's just a comparison of how small, uh, I don't know if you can see if on my screen that the bot bottom most is the virus, which is a red dot compared to a, a 25, 40 micron particle, which you probably can see. So viral particles, whether they're aerosolized or not really cannot be seen. What you're actually seeing is the fluid that encloses these viral particles. Now, when they do studies of aerosols, and this is where I, I sort of become the devil's advocate when it comes to aerosol studies. Uh, there's study that, there was a study that came out that said that aerosols can linger and become viable for as long as three hours. Well, you know, you, you dig a little deeper into that article and it shows you the pro procedure which they did that. So what they did was they had a, an experimental nebulizer, they call it a three-point nebulizer, and they connected that to this drum, okay? And then the drum has absolute, is contained. So in that containment, they sucked out, periodically they sucked out samples and tested them for viral viability because a virus is only infectious as it is viable, okay? So after three hours, they still found viable viruses in this chamber. Now, realistically speaking, we don't exist in, in this chamber, right? So that's where the, the, that um, particular experiment fails to replicate what we have in real life, okay? In our dental offices, in our medical operating rooms. So you have to take the three R's with a grain of salt. In fact, for those of you who have, who have seen the latest CDC recommendations and read through it, they, they, they did, they came out with the set of recommendations, maybe what, two days ago, three days ago, something like that. Um, they recommend actually that before you start your disinfection, that you wait around 15 minutes, 20 minutes for aerosols to settle before you do your disinfection of your, of your operatory area. What does it tell you? It tells you that uh, aerosols in a real life setting, in a room, do not probably, most probably do not stay for three hours, but only stay for maybe maximum of 20 minutes uh, in the air, okay? So that's a bit of comfort from us. So the question is, okay, the question is, 
Okay, this next slide. Are dental aerosols the same as this one? Okay, I'm, this is a frame by frame. I'm sure some of you have seen this. It came out in JAMA, very new. Uh, oh, well, this isn't very new actually. This study was done ten, uh, seven years ago, but it was republished with some new information by the same authors. And this is a frame by frame or 2000 frame per second uh, video of a sneeze, induced sneeze. Okay, so you notice that the uh, aerosolized respiratory droplets can go as far as 43 inches over a period of 0.24 seconds. So less than a second, it can reach 43 inches. And then the next um, frame will show you that it can even reach further than that. Uh, there, up to 26 feet. Okay, so are you scared enough? That's five seconds up to 26 feet. Now, that, the problem with that study is that's done under controlled conditions. So you don't have airflow, you don't have air conditioning. And, and again, you have to take, you, you, you cannot relate that to our dental aerosol simply because a sneeze is not the same as aerosolizing procedures, whether it's medical or dental, okay? Exhaling, sneezing, or coughing, okay, creates a turbulent multi-phase gas cloud that protects droplets from evaporation. Once those droplets come out of the mouth, then they start to evaporate. And when they travel, they're influenced by airflow, your air conditioning, humidity, uh, whether your room is warm or cold. And the dispersion, it does not necessarily go at a straight trajectory either. And when you sneeze or cough, that's already a high velocity projectile. Whereas in, a, in, in scaling, in ultrasonic scalers, in turbines, the projection of your droplets are towards the mouth and whatever is projected outside of the mouth really is peripheral to the main cone of projection. Therefore, it is not also an accurate depiction of what aerosols can do. So when you talk about viral transmission on this slide, most viruses are actually transmitted by droplets whether they are droplets from speaking or sneezing uh, here, that's why we have to maintain some distance or wear masks or distant, distant droplets by, because a patient sneezed or sings, believe it or not, singing can create distant droplets or even coughing, or it can be in the form of deposition on surfaces. So that's, an indirect method of infection. So you can have direct inhalation by either speaking, close quarters uh, conversation, or sneezing, coughing, or singing, or by indirect transmission through droplets on the environment or the surfaces. Now, viruses, the majority of viral transmission occurs via close contact or air, airborne, quote unquote, but not long distance airborne contact, okay? Because as the distance between the source and yourself increases, the viability of the droplet to harbor viable viruses also diminishes. Okay, so aerosol is essentially a relative and not an absolute term. So the larger the droplet can remain airborne in a, in a room, uh, the, the, the larger droplet that can remain airborne in the room, okay, can remain, uh, have more viable viruses. So if a droplet is very, very tiny and dries up quickly and, and, and is suspended for a long period of time, the chances are those vi the, the viruses there or the particles are just particles and not actual viruses. So that's a little bit of tempering of what we know about uh, viruses. In, in, when we talk about aerosol generating procedures, we also have to distinguish between are, are we generating 
uh, medical-like or dental-like procedures. And the medical procedures that are that can generate uh, droplets are more dangerous actually than the ones we generate in the dental office. Why? Because simply because because the uh, gener the medically in um, uh, produced aerosols are basically come from the lower respiratory tract. So when they do induced, uh, I'm sorry, intubation, bronchoscopy, CPR, you are actually forcing out droplets from the respiratory tract of a patient. So the, the, our healthcare workers who have been infected doing these procedures, it's mainly because they were largely unprotected. No, either they were not wearing masks or if they were wearing masks, they were not wearing eye pr protective eyewear. So no one gets contaminated just because the droplets stuck to their hair, unless of course they touch their the surfaces. They were not gloved uh, in emergency emergency procedures. Sometimes they forget to the glove and they just intubate or they uh, mechanical mechanical ventilation, and it goes to your hand and you indirectly contaminate yourself. So the aerosol composition of medical procedures varies differently. It you know coughing and forced medical aerosols emits up to a thousand times more droplets compared to normal breathing and many of our patients in the dental office don't really cough while we're doing procedures with them right they are lying down you're suctioning out of course unless you know the fluid goes into the wrong place while you're doing a procedure in which they cough but that's not very common either so we have a meta-analysis of studies that use nebulizers and they, they study that nebulizing, medical nebulizing, okay, not experimental nebulizing, actually posed no significant risk in the transmission of, at the time they studied SARS-CoV-1 to healthcare workers. First of all, healthcare workers were adequately protected uh, when, they, when, when they were in contact with the patient. So in dental procedures, we have this. So whatever dye you see in this phospho, uh, phosphoilluminated photo, okay, or UV illuminated photo, are droplets. As I said, these droplets are large. They fall from within three feet of the, the patient. And for as long as you're adequately protected with eyewear and a fairly good fitting mask, then you're fine. Now, on the right-hand side, you have your aerosolizing, your turbine handpiece or your scaler. Now the aerosol that, that that generates does not probably probably okay I'm saying probably because viruses are different from bacteria number one and most studies show that the amount of viable viruses in aerosols at least the studies that have it is very very little or nominal so it's established also that when we do high volume evacuation so HVE not your regular saliva ejector uh, you can actually dispel or rather sorry suction out around 90% of the aerosols that it's generating already. So that's one, probably one mitigating uh, thing we have in, in, in dentistry that medicine doesn't have, the high volume evacuators, because surgical suctions in an OR are not considered high volume evacuation, okay? So dental aerosols basically will not stay for three hours, as I mentioned, but only for maybe between 10, 10 to 30 minutes, depending also on the airflow of your operatory. So I don't know if that's a good thing for you or not, but for me it is. So in, in a dental setting, this paper came out, I think sometime in February, uh, in dental practice, we were concentrating on the aerosols generated by your handpiece, etc. But there are some papers coming out now, at least opinion papers, okay, opinion papers saying that we should actually look at getting in, if, if we get infected patients, meaning symptomatic patients in our offices. So they now are emphasizing screening, either remote, remote and in-office screening a day before the appointment, three days before an appointment, and then a day before an appointment because that is where you weed out those that have higher viral shedding versus um, doing aerosolized procedures in the dental practice. Because when you have a patient 
when you have a dental patient who is symptom free, who you only, uh, you don't even say suspect, suspected patient, but what we, what we call as suspected carriers, okay? Suspected carriers has never been shown in previous virus studies, viral studies, or COV-1, MERS. They've never been shown to be infect, infectious or to be shedding viruses during the asymptomatic phase. So the chances of those viruses actually uh, turning up in saliva while you're doing a procedure is very nominal. Now, we are, of course, extrapolating data from previous studies. And these previous studies are not, are not that long ago, uh, maybe 10 years back with uh, SARS-1 and MERS. So that's not a very, uh, very diff bad thing to, to consider when we're doing our work these days with COV-2. And it's been found that the COV-19 virus is very similar in size to influenza. So we can, we can probably extrapolate some data from studies done in influenza uh, with regard to infection and aerosolizing and extrapolate it to COVID-19, okay? I'm not saying that it's exactly the same. What I'm saying is we can extrapolate a lot of the data and maybe we'll discover some differences as we go along. So of note is uh, an infection happens not only because, the presence of a vi because of the presence of the virus, but the amount of viable viral load present in the droplet of fomite during viral shedding. And as I said, unless you have a symptomatic COVID-19 patient that you have to treat, most patients, our patients, call in the office and say many times, I'm not feeling well, I'm not, I have to break my appointment. Or they'll call and say, doc, I have a cold, I have a cough, should I come for my appointment? So before it was a mild cough, you probably say, yeah, that's not a problem, you know. But now, you probably want to say, no, no, see me after a couple of weeks when you're, when you're done with that, okay? Because now we know that from within five days, three to five days of symptoms, uh, the virus, the COVID-19, seems to increase its shedding in the upper respiratory tract and becomes present in the salivary glands. So what are the major differences between the flu? Because I mentioned that earlier and the coronavirus. The uh, COVID-19 has a six to seven day incubation period with a mean of about three to five days. So you're probably gonna see, when a patient is infected, they're probably gonna have symptoms within a week. So, uh, and, and lucky for us, as I said, we, we don't see patients who are symptomatic or they voluntarily break their appointments versus for a flu, which is faster, two to three days. That also, this accounts, Okay, this accounts, six, six to seven days, for what we call pre-symptomatic transmission among community-acquired, in a community-acquired COVID-19. So you have a family household where they're in close quarters and someone went out, got infected, and they're still, you know, getting together for meals and all of those things. Within one week, they've, they've infected most of their family members. So a lot of the uh, infection comes from community-acquired uh, infection versus the flu, which is two to three days. So shorter duration of uh, before symptoms come out. So it's also easy to monitor and track those who are infected with the flu. So vi flu virus sheds between two to six days, whereas COVID-19 is shedding between eight days to 20 days. It's a prolonged period of shedding. But again, as dentists, we have less to fear because, again, we will not be seeing patients who are symptomatic, who are shedding the virus. Even, even within 21 days from infection, they'll probably give time for themselves to get well and well enough. Versus, for example, doctors, medical healthcare workers who have to constantly see patients uh, in, in the hospital or for testing, okay, they're more exposed to that. But, but we as dental healthcare workers aren't. Uh, the difference also is that COVID-19 seems to predispose to secondary infection or multi-organ infection. We know that. We know that now from autopsies that are being done on deceased COVID-19 patients. Uh, and also the mortality. Flu has a 0.1% mortality, but again, flu has been around for 
uh, centuries, okay? So we probably developed better, a better immune response to it. Whereas COVID-19 is, is new, uh, six months, seven months probably, and our immune system is just starting to get better now when it comes to that. So uh, I'll stick my neck out here, maybe in a year's time, we'll probably see diminished cases of mortality as well. And we know that mortality is also in the, in at least uh, what we see is they seem to occur in, in patients of comorbid conditions, uh, whether you're younger or, or older. And the evidence, okay, here's a uh, quote from an article in Anesthesia in 2020. The evidence defining aerosol generating procedure comes largely from low quality case and cohort studies, okay, where the production was never quantified. Okay, the exact mode of transmission was unknown and the production of the aerosols was, unquanti was never quantified. So this paper says that the transmission is associated with time in proximity to severe respiratory coronavirus one patients, which they are extrapolating for COVID-19 with respiratory symptoms rather than procedures per se. So what it's saying is it's your exposure to symptomatic patients rather than the actual procedure you're doing which may give you higher risk. So the bottom line is you do your triage, you do your screening, you eliminate the patients who are symptomatic, you eliminate the patients who have nonspecific symptoms for the time being, and actually practicing is less risky. Okay, there's no 100%, but at least it might be less risky. Now let's go to a bit of engineering workflows and modifications because we've talked about I've talked about this in previous webinars. So the things you should consider are clinic size and configuration. Uh, can you do modifications separating your reception areas from your operatories? Uh, okay, operatory size and configuration. Can you make your operatory smaller than it was before by isolating it? You have to consider personal and patient movement, uh, identification of clean and contaminated areas. You have to also study the type of ventilation you have. Uh, it's easier to deal with a passive ventilation, air conditioning ventilation, like what we have in centralized air conditioning versus something that is on demand, like your individual air conditioning unit where you can increase the fan, the blower, or decrease the blower or increase the temperature. That's, that's, that's harder to deal with because you're constantly changing airflow characteristics of your room. Maybe also the ability to install modifications like creating a quote unquote, okay, I say quote unquote negative pressure operatory because you really, you really cannot create a totally negative pressure operatory because most of these are just after afterthought modifications. And most of the papers that I'm just going to go through this quickly, I'm not going to go through it in detail anymore. Uh, most of the, the things I got with regard to isolation, negative pressure isolation, is from a publication by the Minnesota Department of Health, Airborne Infections, Infectious Disease Management. It's, it's a manual that's downloadable on the internet. And it shows you basically, oh, not this one. This is not from Minnesota. This is from one of our COVID hospitals, okay? Um, this, this is nice because what they did here, okay, I'll talk about Minnesota in a short while. But this is nice because this room was a regular ward, which they converted into a negative pressure isolation suite. And what they did was install a series of um, exhaust fans, seal all the windows, remove the air conditioning, and they put ducting from the exhaust fans out. Of course, measuring the volume of air that they had to move out. And then they disinfected the uh, ducted air on the right side, right hand side of your screen with ultraviolet um, radiation. So some of you have been with me in, in PGH would, would, would uh, recognize this place. You know? So this is, this is the ward where they used to see, the initial ward where they used to see COVID-19 infected patients and they did this. So it's doable even for our settings if you, if you really wanna do it. It's not very costly either. Okay, so going back, these are the just the pages in that manual that I showed you using a HEPA filtration and how to duct it out, using a HEPA filtration and 
putting it in the return unit of the uh, hospital or the facility that you are in, or if you don't have a in in installed built-in air supply, you can do a, an isolation with plastic isolations material and your HEPA filtration, throwing clean air out and making air sorry making air go back. Uh, making air go back into the uh, isolation suite by just just getting air from leakages around the around the uh, isolation curtain. So these are these are some ideas. My my point of showing you this is for you to understand or at least pick up the principle behind a negative isolation suite. So a negative isolation suite preferably must not have airflow within it. Preferably. Okay, but of course, we know that many dental offices have their air conditioning systems inside their operatories. So you've got to figure out a way to at least mitigate the uh, turbulence of your air conditioning. And that's the, it's, that's the point I'm trying to drive at when it comes to isolation. And this is just a diagram. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at, at drawing these things, but this is a diagram of how we were planning to modify one of our clinics. Uh, we have our air conditioning unit up here. Uh, we are going to close our operatory here and open up our reception area. Patients will no longer wait in the reception area over here at the bottom. And we are going to create an exhaust fan near on top of the chair. And when we turn on the exhaust fan, the air comes from both the air conditioned area into the reception area, into the isolated area. And we are going to draw in some air from the uh, an open window in our uh, restroom, comfort room, with louvered wind, with louvered doors here to get some fresh air into the room. Okay, so that's just a concept that we were thinking of doing. In one of, of course, installing a HEPA filter just to scrub the air some more and exhausting that air out into an open space. Uh, basically, uh, we were allowed to do this already. We're just trying to make it as uh, clean as possible if it's if it's uh, doable at this point but we haven't done it because we, we're just opening now. We don't have workers yet. So this is another concept that we're trying to do the same configuration, but moving the air conditioning inside the waiting room, the former waiting room of the patient and give, putting the exhaust where the former air conditioning system was and without having to isolate the entire operatory anymore, but the entire um, clinical area can serve as an isolation area. And then we will just move our instruments into the former waiting room. Now, the waiting room now, at least in our hospital, would be outside over here. Okay, so the air is drawn from the waiting room into the, op the operatory area. So the principle behind this really is uh, the, even the, the new CDC guidelines recommend that if you're going to, to treat symptomatic patients, and I would have to say even regular patients, that you align your operatory parallel to your airflow. So if you notice, this is kind of parallel to the airflow going the direction going up. And if you notice the previous uh, slide, sorry, I can't seem to get the previous slide there. If you go through the previous slide, again, the reason why we circled it this way is so that the air also becomes parallel to the to the upper, the dental chair with the head of the person, the patient over here. So none of the uh, droplets you generate, okay, none of the droplets you generate will lie within your breathing space. And that's the idea, okay, that's the idea of creating a parallel airflow in your offices, so that you, you your the the air that that is drawn and the the aerosol you generate over here. Okay, for those of you can see my, my cursor, do not linger around your breathing space because the operator generally is working here. So everything is exhausted out past the breathing, the immediate breathing area of the dental healthcare worker. Same as, same as here, dental healthcare workers here. So it's just drawn out this way. And then uh, another floor plan for two, two operatories. So here it's less than ideal because we, we have no air source from out here. So we're drawing air source from, from the common area, from the air conditioned area, exhausting it. And hopefully we draw out everything away from the dental practitioner who sits behind the chair over here. So 
you know, the uh, important thing is to study your offices when you're when you're doing these modifications, if you if you even can. Now, for those offices who cannot, I would I believe that the next best thing would be to install a, a an air scrubber such as a HEPA a contamination unit. And you know, we, we seem to be all pa panic about what kind of HEPA filtration to buy, and you know, different manufacturers posting on Facebook. On the internet, tell you we have a three stage, whatever, or with UV and uh, you know, additional stuff that they put in front of those filters. Well, you know, doing some research, a, a regular true HEPA filter, whether it's 12, 13, that's installed in your HEPA units is good enough. The rating of a HEPA filter might be 0 0.3 only because the studied gaps of the multi-layer over here, this one, the gaps, okay, are about 0.3 microns in diameter. But the thing with HEPA units, okay, is that they filter uh, particles by a principle called diffusion. So when you have diffusion of particles, these particles undergo, okay, I'm sorry for the technical terms, okay, but they, they undergo like a pinball type of motion or what we call, they call it Brownian motion. So at the top here, if you can see the smallest particle, they are very erratic in the way they are sucked into the HEPA filtration. And because the HEPA filters has, uh, you know, several hundred layers of filter media, they get caught anyway. So a HEPA filter is, well, a HEPA filter is rated at 0.3. They will catch particles smaller than 0.1 or even smaller than 0.1 microns, okay? Without having to increase, without having to place UV and all of those things. Besides a UV lighting, the exposure time is critical to, to infectious agents. So if you're driving particles past a UV in a split second, the chances of them getting disinfected anyway are, are nominal, all right? So what you need is really a good, credible, HEPA filtration unit with good with a good seal of the filter on the unit itself, and run the HEPA unit in your operatories at a low a, as low a speed as possible. So each HEPA unit has different. So some HEPA units have a speed adjustment, and they also give the number of air changes it can give at what particular speed. So if you can buy a HEPA unit that can do eight to 12 air changes in your in the volume of your op operatory at the lowest setting of the HEPA unit, that's the most ideal HEPA unit that you can buy. Okay, so I'm not gonna recommend any, any brands. I, um, th just the principles behind it. And here's a wonderful study that they did on the effectiveness of air, air scrubbers or air cleaners in a droplet aerosol in a droplet and aerosolized dispersion uh, room. Okay, so they basically have a, an enclosed room where they have an inlet of air supply. So parang centralized, it's like a centralized air conditioning system and exhaust, of course, in a centralized air conditioning system, you have both inlet and exhaust. And they place the HEPA filtration unit at different places. So one is at the foot of the patient on the corner of the room. One is immediately at the foot of the patient. One is immediately behind the operator and one is immediately, I mean, immediately behind the patient's head and one is immediately behind the operator on the right side. And what they found out based on their dispersion studies and they did a lot of physics and math here, which they, they cal calculated, they did special projections, uh, video projections of these things. And they calculated gaseous aerosols. And they found out that those the best places to place these HEPA filters are at an area beside your work area, number two over here, number five behind, directly behind the head of the patient over here, or number four at the foot of the patient. Because all these places, okay, all these places seem to draw air away from the breathing area of the dental healthcare worker over here. So this is your breathing area. So if you put it behind you or be, near the inlet of the room or near the corner of the room, what happens is when the, when the air movement goes this way, it passes through your breathing area for a longer period of time, which also increases your 
contamination. I'm not saying infect, risk for infection, okay, but your, your time of contamination with aerosols. So the best places to put your HEPA filtration would be somewhere around the head of the patient away from you or the foot of the patient away from you over here. Okay, so for those of you who want to read that paper, the title is here and the reference is also on the upper right side. So I'm going to go quickly. There are many, many questions regarding EOVs or external extraoral vacuum units. Now, extraoral vacuum units were originally marketed and sold for vapor removal of mercury. For those who were doing, you know, during the mercury scare, you remove amalgam restorations and replace them with composite or, or crowns or whatever. And they would supposedly vape, you know, suck out all the vapor, which is of course impossible given the term that it's vaporized, okay? So anyway, they're available with a variety of add-on filters, HEPA, UVC, carbon beads. Uh, you don't need all of it. Uh, if you want to put a HEPA with a carbon bead or activated carbon filter, some of them give you that option. That's, that's very good. If you wanna use only HEPA, that's good too. As I said earlier, the important thing is you use a low setting because lower velocity means that the particles are, 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 are able to be, the filters are able to trap the particles better than if they're placed in a, in a high velocity. Okay, so uh, they're effective in reducing dental aerosols. I think most studies will show that. That's not, a, that's not an issue. We, we, I believe that it does help, but if you already have an intraoral uh, HVE, is it worth spending another, how much is it in the US? $2,000 in the US, about, I think it's about 1,500 here, something like that, to buy another extra oral suction unit. If you have your assistant anyway, using your HVE and where the effectivity of HVE has been shown properly used will be about 90%. But for those of you who are, have very busy practices, who have practices wherein you, you don't have an assistant full-time, and you do have to do two-handed dentistry for, for simpler uh, uh, procedures like, like scaling or you have dental hygienists who are working for you who have no assistance, an EOV might be a good way to mitigate aerosols. Okay, so that's, that's for me, that's a very good substitute for an assistant who cannot do your HV suctioning for you. But if you have a full-time assistant that can do it, then you might not need it anymore. There, we have no study on how office airflow affects effectiveness of these units because most studies done are done under, under still air conditions or controlled conditions. They also, because of the placement of the uh, unit, they interfere with your work area if you're a forehanded practice, okay, of dentistry. They are effective if they're placed only within 27 or about a foot from your, from your source. And... Uh, they are most effective if they're, if they're used in conjunction with other aerosol mitigating devices. And of course, they're expensive. So I, I recommend this for certain situations, but not for all situations. So that's how supposedly effective it is. Of course, this is a uh, demo of a uh, manufacturer. I, I, I blocked off the manufacturer. This is one of the uh, more sturdier models I've seen here locally. What are the other miscellaneous devices that we, we can use to mitigate um, droplets? So now I'm using droplets as a generic term for both aerosols and droplets, because as I said, the term is relative. So isolite, dry shield, easy dam, isovac, but more, most importantly, uh, those who, of you who have not been using a rubber dam for procedures where you can use a rubber dam, I suggest rubber dams are excellent ways of mitigating droplets and aerosols because they really separate the saliva, which contains microorganisms from your uh, water spray. Let's talk a little bit about masks because someone asks, asked me about masks in, in one of the Facebook posts. Uh, you have two types. So basically you have your FFP1 surgical masks on the left side, and then you have your respirator masks. So the question was, are, well, the question is, of course, they're not the same because FFP1 or your surgical masks over here are too loosely fitting to contain any uh, leakages around the mouth. And also the, the, the main reason for surgical masks really is for that 
so that the operator does not actually contaminate a patient and not the other way around. Although, although surgical masks do afford a, a good amount of protection from droplets as well. Studies done with surgical masks in a healthcare setting on patients with influenza and even SARS-1 show that healthcare workers who wore surgical masks versus respirator masks had about almost equal protection. When I say almost equal protection, it means that there's not much difference between the number of healthcare workers who got infected with, with flu, those who wore, with those who wore uh, surgical masks versus those who wore respirator masks. So for procedures that are non-prolonged aerosol generating, a good certified surgical mask is good enough because we are now we now have a shortage of uh, respirator masks anyway. So this is just a con comparative study of the particle removal of different masks. So FFP1 or P1, which is your regular surgical masks, uh, are 80% efficient compared to your respirators, which are FFP2 and N95s, which is which borders around 94, 95. Okay, so. Be be at least be a little bit more sane with re wearing a respirator mask because you can't wear an, a respirator mask for prolonged periods of time, uh, especially if you know you're just seeing patients for cementation or impressions or something like that. You probably don't need a respirator mask for that. There's an issue between valve or non-valve masks. Uh, the recommendation is you use a non-valve mask because valve masks were not meant for uh, treating patients because your ex exhalate your your breath exhales through this valve unfiltered. So this is used for occupations that are high in particulates, like your your carpentry, painting, where you have to breathe clean air but exhale not you know exhale regular your regular breath. So valve uh, masks are probably not uh, a good idea, but what if there's a shortage, you can probably get a valve mask, but you might want to wear a regular surgical mask over it as well to protect the patient. Okay, so that's just a tip. My friend asked me, are all respirator masks the same? Well, your F the US FDA does not recommend certain types of respirator models, particularly the 8210, because for surgical use, only because they do not meet the standards for penetration of blood that is that is projected. Because sometimes you're doing surgical procedure, medical surgical procedures, and you accidentally nick an artery and the dark, that, that blood spurts into your face. Uh, some mask respirator mask models are not built for that kind of protection. Okay, so you have to also look at the type of respirator mask. But for dental use, because we don't have that straight, uh, large stream spurting of, of, of uh, blood or, or projectile interface, plus the fact that most of us wear a face shield when we're doing aerosols, this is, this is an acceptable type of uh, respirator mask that you can use in your procedure. So, again, if you want to research on that study I was talking about with regard to respirators versus medical masks. This is the uh, reference. It's in JAMA 2019. There are four or five papers that also do the same or, or have the same findings. So what are some of the challenges that we uh, have to overcome in our dental practice? Is you know, some of the questions we cannot answer at this point, given the six-month pandemic. Is the virus airborne? Well, available data based on influenza and even SARS-CoV-1 says no. But the question is, does it hold true for COVID-19? We don't know. Do aerosols contain the viral load? Because as I said, it's not just viral particles that are infectious, but the viable viral load, including time exposure. So most papers say not likely because aerosols dry up, when they dry up, they become particulate. When they become particulate, the virus essentially dies on exposure to, to certain types of humidity and temperature. So when, when they're gaseous already, 
they, 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 many of them don't um, become infectious. And that, we've seen that in SARS and influenza where it's not airborne. Okay. Do asymptomatic persons have a high viral shedding to cause in infection? Some of the studies that show asymptomatic persons uh, transmitting the virus actually have been refuted on the papers themselves by, by, by uh, letters to the editor. They, they did the follow-ups of, of supposedly the asymptomatic patient, the persons who, who, who uh, infected the, the other people, and they found out based on these follow-ups that those supposedly asymptomatic persons really had symptoms, albeit mild. Okay, but we have no large case studies yet. So, you know, we, we, we cannot tell for sure. Do we develop real immunity to the virus? Uh, some of the infectious disease specialists, I say, yeah, we do after you've recovered. There's no reason why, why we, we don't. I mean, for, for COV-1, for influenza, we do develop a bit of immunity. Sorry, a bit of immunity to it after being infected. That's why you have the seasonal flu viruses, which are... Which, which give you a, a vaccine on different strains because you've probably developed immunity to some strains already. Because antibodies, particularly IgG, do appear uh, after about three weeks from, from an infection. Okay? But again, we don't have large-scale studies that um, can show this. Now, just to give you a bit of perspective of where we are. So this is just the, the, the number of people who have died from previous pandemics. Or, or epidemic. So we, we are kind of here at the bottom, center bottom in COVID-19 based April 20, 166,000 people worldwide. But contrast that to uh, the Hong Kong flu in the 60s, 70s, a million. Uh, of course, we're still counting deaths until now. We don't know if it's still going to increase in the next year, two years or three years. But uh, it seems like the mortality is going down. I don't know about the Philippines, but at worldwide, it seems like it's going down. And uh, some light at the end of the tunnel. Dental aerosol transmissions have little or no history of infectivity with regular PPE. Uh, if we use PPEs, if, if we use HDEs uh, that are practiced. And this even applies to tuberculosis, which unlike COVID-19 is known as an airborne disease. Okay. So, so far, six months of patient data have clearly established that COVID-19 is spread primarily by droplet transmission. Droplets meaning, okay, both aerosolized droplets and non-aerosolized droplets from symptomatic patients, not asymptomatic patients. The probability of infection from viral exposure is proportional to both the dose, the viral load, and the time of exposure. So, you, ha you might have enough viral load, but if you have your PPs and your exposure time is low, then you, you, you probably won't get infected. If you have not enough of the viral load, but you have a long procedure, you probably won't get infected either. And if you have not enough viral load from asymptomatic persons or patients who, who, who we just assume to be carriers, but are not really infected, and you do a long procedure, then it's probably very, very low risk. The lowest rate of viral shedding occurs during nasal breathing, and our patients don't really cough or breathe through the nose, or at least they don't breathe very, very uh, deeply and exhale very, very strongly when we're doing a dental procedure. Patients generally don't speak during a procedure uh, or shout or sing. You know? The dentist might be the one singing during a procedure, but you're wearing a mask anyway. So therefore, the potential for viral dose is quite low. The situation is dramatically different, okay, from aerosol generating medical procedures as we have seen uh, where the aerosol generating procedures are actually in, in medical procedures actually may induce coughing or sneezing in a very bad way. Okay. So that's the light at the end of the tunnel. So for those of us who are thinking of going to practice, I think we, we need to take all the information or the last six months, especially the ones that have caused us a lot of panic, with a grain of salt, but at the same time, you know, I encourage people not to be cavalier about their work and about uh, how they will be um, seeing patients. It's, it's still good to assume probably that people are carriers, but with the data that we have now, even if they may be carriers, for as long as they're not symptomatic, they probably are not infectious 
And if you practice the right protocols and procedures outlined in many, many different places, then you're, we're probably going to not be infected, probably going to be okay. So with that, I turn over the, um, the mic to our host. I can, I'm done with my lecture. Thank you very much for listening, especially my friends, classmates from the other side of the globe where it's 11 p.m. So there, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So we now see the light. Before we go to some questions, Dr. Rochelle. Okay. Sir, thank you for that lecture. Yeah, I promised that I was going to give something different, right? Let's go okay. to Q&A, sir. Unfortunately, we were not able to group all the questions because they were coming in, in, in the streams. Yeah. So we will just go ahead and ask. And if it was asked, we will just uh, eliminate the question. Anyway, the first question is, can sweat contain transmissible COVID-19 virus? Um, I, I have not read a single paper on sweat. Maybe the idea there was because they, they discourage gyms from opening, right? But yes. really, it's not the sweat that they're considering there, but it's the uh, exhaling of people who exercise. Okay. So, you know, when you're doing a lot of exercising, first of all, you can't wear a respirator mask when you're exercising. Your, carb, your carbon there's, dioxide levels. There's is, one that's available. They're selling it. Ah, okay. You can wear but, it. Uh, for but, you know, again... Again, you have to go through the entire hygiene, the locker rooms, uh, disinfecting the uh, equipment. So, you know, it's, but sweat, um, maybe if it's mixed in with uh, respiratory secretions, maybe. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mon? Okay, sir, we have one question. Uh, and I have several questions that are similar to this. So this is... I have a 10 square meter clinic. Do I have to install an air purifier or make it a negative room or just open the windows for air exchange for aerosol generating procedures? Do I open the windows during or after the procedure? Okay, um, 10 square meters, that's uh, not a very big space, which we, we, you're, you're kind of lucky actually that you have a small, small space to contain. Okay, so number one, that's, that's an advantage. Uh, second is, remember what I said, you're not really treating symptomatic patients, or at least you should not treat symptomatic patients at this point if you cannot have the proper ventilation of your room. So what you can do is, uh, in a 10 uh, square meter area, yes, you should put the HEPA filter um, because a HEPA filter properly computed for the volume of your room will scrub the air uh, several times an hour, which, which is what you need. You might want to open your window a little bit so you have a source of fresh air. That's a good idea. Um, you don't have to keep it fully open. You just need to open it partially. There is a nice diagram I, for, I failed to show here. It's in one of the study, which gave you the percentages of needed air exchanges from a HEPA filter if you open your door, if you open your window, if they're fully closed, et cetera, et cetera. And whenever you open your window, you reduce the number of air exchanges that you will need in your room because you have fresh air coming. So in, in that sense, do you need to install an exhaust fan? See, the thing is, uh, study your, your, your room. If, if you can, duck an exhaust fan out and you, have a better, and, and you can get a fresh source of air in, then you might want to do a small exhaust fan. That's fine. If you don't have a way of ducting fresh air in except through the window, probably opening the window partially and having a HEPA filter there probably is good enough. For as long as you do your, you don't treat patients who are, patients who are, of course, symptomatic, you should be fine. And sir, that is during the procedure, not? During the procedure, of course, yeah. Okay. During procedure. Okay, Rosha? Okay. Sir, I have several related questions to that. So let's, let's get to it. Maybe I'll ask them all together so you can just tie it up. Would it be safer to turn off the AC if it's centralized? That's one. Two, what if the air-conditioned operatory room is only equipped with an air filter machine and HVE? Any way to create an airflow? And if the room has central air conditioner, do we still need air supply? So these are three related questions to that. 
Um, okay, the first is, should you turn off a centralized air conditioning? I don't know if you can do that, but I don't know if you want to do that. You might want to, uh, your, a centralized air conditioning system is already passive air coming out. So what you don't want to do is to increase the airflow. So you can probably ask your building administration to set it to the lowest airflow possible. Okay, so that's good enough. The inlet of centralized air conditioning, I believe, uh, draws in fresh air, or at least with air handling units, they draw in a little bit of fresh air. So that's a good idea already. Do you need a HEPA filter? Yeah, definitely a HEPA filter will still help scrub the air despite your, your centralized air conditioning. Did that answer the three questions? Yes, sir. Yes. This is very specific. If you can use an EOV with four filters with HEPA filter, UVC, plasma ionizer, instead of a separate air purifier, HEPA filter unit, can the EVO work continuously for more than 12 hours? I don't think, manufac yeah, um, the manufacturers state clearly, I think that they'll, it can only run continuously for maximum. I think the, the, the model I saw six hours maximum. So it's not designed to run for prolonged periods of time, unlike a regular HEPA filtration unit for one reason, because when an EOV is running, it is getting air from a constricted port. So your motor is heating up. Okay, so you can't run it continuously for more than some say four hours, some say six hours. Now, even if you run it at the maximum number of hours, the number, the service life of your EOV unit isn't going to be long. So you also have to think about that when you're buying an EOV unit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So again, sir, I think you mentioned this earlier, but this was a pre-registration question. So just to repeat, yeah. what is the minimum suction power of an HVE to efficiently evacuate and reduce aerosols generated by procedures? What is the minimum suction power of the extra oral suction machine to capture aerosols efficiently? Um, I think the figure they, they give is about 100 cubic uh, feet of air per minute. Okay, so CFM, 100 CFM. Uh, they don't put the fluid volume, they put air volume of suction because you're suctioning essentially aerosols from the procedure. So 100, 100. And I heard from one seminar that it's, if you can suction out one liter of water within one minute, that's good enough. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, another question. Any epidemiologic studies on dental healthcare worker transmission that you know of? See, that's the beauty of it. Most studies show only contamination, okay? No, I, I know of no epidemiologic studies looking at healthcare, dental healthcare workers that have shown that we, we do get infected by aerosols and droplets. There are studies that show contamination by indirect transmission, needle sticks probably or or uh, splatter on the face, and it has to do with herpes, okay, HPV. But that's when a health, dental healthcare worker gets splashed on into the eyes directly. Yeah, but I, I'm not, I, I'm not uh, familiar with any study, sorry. Oh, that's good to know, sir. Rochelle? We'll ask questions from, sir, the same, huh? if we can open a window, do we still need an exhaust fan? Um, I think you answered that. You were mentioning um, the litter of fluid. Is the litter, is one litter of fluid evacuation per minute from an HPE of the dental chair enough to suction 90% of the aerosols? 90%? Yeah, yeah. No, good. Yeah, well, the studies I think that are being done, there's a current study being done in North Carolina. I just saw this recently uh, in one of the our Viber groups is uh, HVs are able to suction something like close to 90% of the, 
uh, of aerosols. And if you combine it with the other things like, you know, the isolite and all of these things, it this not, never becomes 100%, but at least, it, you know, 90 to 95%. That's what it says. Okay, sir, speaking of HVE, if um, I think that same question was, what should be the airflow rate or the suction flow rate if you're going to buy one? Uh, as I said, if your HVE should rate at 100 CFM, okay, so that's, that's, I think it can be adjusted also from what I know about manufacturers, they can adjust the uh, flow rate and it has to be properly maintained. You have to clean the, the element filter of the fluid as well for it to be uh, properly suctioning. So it's about 100 CFM. Okay. Thank you, Mon. Okay. Um, a question from Dr. Ditas Dominguez. Is hypochlorous acid a good alternative to sodium hypochlorite, benzyl conium chloride, or hydrogen peroxide for disinfection or sterilization of surfaces? What is the right mixture for disinfection using sodium, sodium hypochlorite commercial bleach? Is it 1 is to 10 or 1 is to 100? Can you please clarify, no, sir? Hypochlorous acid. Okay, so so many people now are selling all of these things, no? Uh, hypochlorous acid for disinfection. Or they're probably effective. At least that's the claim. I personally use Lysol, which is a quaternary ammonium compound. It's cheap. You can buy it in the grocery. I mix it properly. The thing with disinfectants, okay? is not the type of disinfectant so much as the contact time. Okay, so you can use bleach if you spray it and you wipe it within five seconds of spraying. It's not disinfecting the surface. It's probably just cleaning it. If you use bleach and you leave it there for five minutes on a non-porous surface, it's gonna disinfect it. I think it's the same with hypochlorous acid. If you use, let's say Lysol at the contact times between five to 10 minutes, of spraying the amount and it's a contact time. It's not the amount. So, so DITAS, the question of dilution, okay, is it's, it should be between one is to 15, one is to 100 is good enough. Again, the dil more diluted it is, it doesn't mean that it's less effective. You just have to keep it there for a longer period of time. So if I, I suggest one is to 100, some even say one is to 500, but of course, 1 is to 500, you have to leave it there for a long, longer period of time. 1 is to 100 is probably okay, and it probably won't damage fabrics as much as a 1 is to 50 or 1 is to 10 dilution, and it won't smell as badly. So our recommendation for commercial bleach, 5%, uh, 1 is to 100 is good enough. Contact time is about two, 2 to 5 minutes, something like that. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, from in our chat box, you might get to see a question from Dean Vic Medina. What is the latest research on pre-asymptomatic persons shedding SARS and CoV-2 virus? Okay, Dean, thank you for that question. That's a great question. I, I kind of touched on that earlier, but uh, just, just for the benefit of uh, everyone. The, the latest are looking at, when we say pre-symptomatic, I suppose it's our patients who eventually became uh, symptomatic, okay? Because iba yung when we say asymptomatic carriers who never become symptomatic and we go pre-symptomatic who were infected and became symptomatic later on. There are papers coming out now in May and, and the latest is symptoms will come out from within two to five days of infection for pre-symptomatic patients. So when we say symptoms, we're talking coughing, sneezing, fever, but pre-symptoms include already dry, dry throat, uh, weakness and, and, and probably bouts of headache. So those are pre-symptoms. So as I said, you don't want to treat patients who already exhibit. That's why pre-screening is important. Okay. Thank you, well, sir. May, may I just interject, Mon? Okay. Um, sir, in relation to that, there was a question here. Since you said, you know, you, you want to pre-test the patient, any thoughts on dentists performing rapid COVID antibody tests in office prior to seeing a patient? No, I, uh, I, I've always said no. Uh, and I think even the uh, esteemed Professor Edsel Salvana would agree uh, based on what is written. No? 
that you, you do rapid tests using serum or antibody tests, number one, they should be performed by professionals who understand how it's done properly so you don't get contamination. Number two, you, you don't do that on patients who are asymptomatic because if you've never had an infection, what antibodies, are you, what IgGs are you going to produce? Nothing. So it might track IgM, but IgM is very nonspecific. You could have had just a regular cold the week before and have IgM. So it's kind of useless and it's kind of a useless expense to do rapid testing for each of your patients. It's, it was, it's a false sense of security, number one. It's wasteful. Thank you, sir. Moen? Yes, there's another question from Zoom. Uh, Dr. Bonken, can you please comment on half-face and full-face respirators with replaceable filters? And sure. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions for, for that after that. Okay. okay. Oh, that's Glenda pala. Hi, Glenda. Okay, uh, full-face respirators with replaceable filters. The problem with that is you have a valve on full face respirators, right? So your intake is safe, but your exhalation is your breath. So you're not really protecting the patient from anything. If you're breathing out, if you have a cold <laughs> or a cough, or, or you probably <laughs> forgot to brush your teeth for the day, your patient's gonna smell that because it has a valve respirator that's unfiltered. Okay, it protects you, but it doesn't protect the patient. There, so that's wh whether it's a full face or half half face respirator with replaceable filter. So I don't encourage um, respirators with with regular exhalation valves. Okay, only for that reason. But protection wise, yeah, it it protects you. And a full face respirator, of course, protects your eyes, so you don't need to wear additional shielding for that. Okay. Sure. I say go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. One, another one from Zoom from Dr. Charlie Achenza. In the hierarchy of controls, particularly in the level of elimination and substitution, teledentistry may still be a good option to adopt in our practices, not only for pre screening purposes, but for actual consul consultations. What are your thoughts on this, sir? No, I totally agree. But um, there, the, it's limited what you can do with the with teledentistry for actual consultations. I mean, the patient has to number one have a good camera. It has to have um, good connection. A patient has a good connection. The resolution of their camera has to be nice enough for you to to see their mouth if they're going to show your mouth, their mouth, or you know whatever their concerns are. So. Pre-screening, teledentistry is uh, probably a good, I would not even say option now, nowadays. It's probably a good method. Of course, uh, the issue there is payment. There are now many, some gateways available to us that have uh, prepaid consultations that, that can connect you with the patient. But for actual consultations, only, only those wherein you might give an e-prescription at the outset, okay, before you actually do any, of course, before you actually do any work. But even with that, you have to have a disclaimer that there are limitations to the teleconsultation. Thank you, sir. So if we can go back to masks, this is a question I think from um, the OPOP online lectures. According to my colleagues from Denver, as per their Colorado Dental Association, we have to be fully gowned with caps, booties, face shields, and N95. We are still in crisis mode, so the CDC is allowing the reuse of N95s. We are to keep our masks on all day except for lunch. My question is, if we are in the clinic in between procedures, may we remove our masks while we are out of the contaminated areas and operatories? Okay, so basically that's what we do already in, in, in the hospital. When we're in non-contaminated areas, we just use a regular surgical mask and practice distancing. But, you know, the caveat to that is what does your local government actually instruct you to do? Do they require you to wear the surgical mask even in non-contaminated areas? I would think you wouldn't have to, but at least wear a surgical mask when you're in non-contaminated areas and interacting with, with staff and even probably wear a protective eyewear. I would do that. Sir, a follow-up to that. Um, what is your opinion of using skin, tape, 
micropore tape around the entire periphery of a surgical mask to be able to seal it. Siguro, sir, if it's not the right fit, diba? sometimes you get something, you order online, it's not the right fit. True. Because when you talk, your mask moves, right? So it displaces. So only to stabilize it, I don't think it will add much to... Well, of course, you don't have a physical connection between the environment anymore and the inside of the mask. So it might protect you from larger droplets also. We tried to do that in PGH with a mm -hmm. fit tester and we taped around a regular surgical mask and it didn't prevent any smell from coming in. But then again, it was just a surgical mask. So the particulate filtration is not as high as a respirator mask. So it will help in stabilizing the surgical mask. Masakit lang pag tinanggal mo. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a good way of uh, doing that. So, but using it, was it comfortable enough that you were able to work for hours? Yeah. I think you were yeah. duty for like 9 to 1, di ba? Yeah. So much time. Yeah. It's good enough. Sir, what about, um, they're asking about the recommendations for dentists. Iba, they came up with the uh, N95, the KN95. Your personal recommendation for our Sorry. purposes? Well, I'll, I'll go with the guidelines that we've put, put out. No? If you're doing a, an a aerosol generating procedure, wear a respirator mask and a face shield. Face shield and, and eyewear. I think, I think we've talked about masks many, many times, but what we've forgotten is the face shield. And I think you've got to invest in a good face shield because your visual field is very important. If you can't see what you're doing, you're constantly moving or maybe even constantly adjusting your shield, and that's a problem. Uh, what would they recommend as a mask? For aerosol generating procedures, a uh, respirator mask now is what is recommended. For non-aerosol generating procedures, you're just taking an impression. You're just fitting a crown without doing any trimming, okay? Uh, use a well-fitted or well-certified uh, uh, FFP1 surgical mask. Don't waste your respiratory masks on, on those. There's no point. Sir, you mentioned simple procedures. Can double surgical masks suffice? Yeah, but w what would be the point of that? I mean, really, you double your surgical mask because you want to double the particle filtration rate. It might work. What you want to do, what you want to do though, is if you're wearing a respirator mask and you want to conserve your respirator mask, you put a surgi regular surgical mask over your respirator mask to conserve your respirator mask. And you just throw away the surgical mask after the procedure. But doubling two surgical masks for me, it's probably not necessary for regular non, non aerosol heavy procedures. Okay, thank you. Sir, you mentioned uh, the face shield. What is yeah. the bare minimum that we can look for? Because a lot came out with it. some with 3D printers, they designed it, some are dentist designs, designed. So, what is the bare minimum that we can look for if we're trying to purchase something? Uh, there are nine, you, you know, I, I, I have to name a brand because I'm, you know, it's the only brand I know really that's been using for a long, long time. The op the op face shields mm -hmm. with the polycarbonate shield. Now, the polycarbonate is uh, scratch resistant, so you can disinfect it a certain number of times. So that's probably the best. A lot of the disposable face shields they're giving out or selling these days are made out of acetate or acrylic material which is not resistant to scratch. So uh, you can't disinfect that X number of times unless you're probably doing m many non-aerosol procedures in one morning, which by the way, is good to do that in your office. Program all your non-aerosol generating procedures in the morning and some of your aerosol generating procedures in the afternoon so that you separate the decontamination process as well as your conservation of your PPEs. Sir, see up the up. Um, if you're wearing loops, the the up the up one, I don't think you, it will fit. But yeah. they were saying there's an up the up uh, the, the two that yeah. would yeah that would. Um, I I not familiar. I I wear regular magnifiers only, so I don't wear the big intricate loops. Uh, so. That uh, it works for me. So my, my suggestion is you 
find one that works for your particular situation in the dental office. Sir, if you're using that and with the next patient, normal disinfection and um, style that you would do for the, for the face shield. Spray, spray it with ethanol or whatever. Uh, I think polycarbonate is quite resistant to even ethanol. Uh, yeah, and, or wipes, if you have those wipes, okay. swipe it down. Yeah, that should be good enough. Uh, the entire shield or buy two. Diba? Buy two. Wipe Wait down. Time, Pardon? Wait time. Let five you minutes. Can actually use it as a spider. Five, five minutes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. More. You're welcome. Sir. Is it a prerequisite to get a flu vaccine before going back to practice? You mean prerequisite by our? Uh, when you say prerequisite, I mean is it good, a good idea to do that? I guess so. There's no study to show that if you get a flu vaccine, that you'll be any less susceptible to being infected by COVID-19. It's a different virus, for one thing. It, does it mitigate the risk of if you have if you don't if you have a flu vaccine, does it mitigate the risk of being infected by another virus? I, I don't know. Uh, in fact, it makes me wonder because you have a flu vaccine every season. That means only means that you don't get to cover all your bases all the time anyway. No? Uh, plus, when you, give a, when, when you receive a flu vaccine, you got to wait a few weeks because sometimes there's a latent reaction to the vaccine that might make you ill. Diba? So that's another issue that you have to watch out for. So I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know. Either way, whatever works for you if you want to have shots before, but wait a few weeks because sometimes you get sick or you, you have symptoms after a vaccine. So I have a question here from Dr. Jerry Sunico. Um, it's a recommendation to wait 15 minutes before disinfecting the room to allow the droplets to settle. Can you sound in your opinion? Yeah. Remember, I mentioned that you do, you wait, about, the CTC at least recommends 15 minutes wait time before you do your disinfection because they assume that the particle, the aerosolized particles have gone down. So about 15 minutes is probably good enough based on CDC uh, recommendation. okay. yeah, recommendations. Thank you. Mon? Okay, I will read from, from Zoom from Dr. X. Belmonte. Thanks, Dickie. Some moments to add. Most transmissions of HCWs occur outside of the ICU and COVID areas. So be careful outside of treatment areas. Do not let your guard down. Another is OR protocols now include patient quarantine 14 days prior to procedure to eliminate need for testing. We can employ this. Okay, in our hospital at least, the requirement for, elect, for patients who are gonna undergo procedures in the hospital is to be swapped, is to be swapped. So, because they cannot be sure that if you tell them, oh, for two weeks, don't go out before your appoint, appointed schedule, uh, you can't be sure of that. So what we do is we, require testing of patients prior to any inpatient or outpatient OR procedures. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, thank you. can we go back to you disinfecting? Yeah. Uh, from Dr. Mary Jane Uy, which is better, UV light or hydrogen peroxide fogging? And can you comment on hypochlorous acid misting during clinic hours? There are, there are those who say that hypochlorous acid misting during clinic hours is safe. They based that on, on, on a few studies. I wouldn't do misting during when, when my staff or myself or even some patients are there because you don't know how they will react to it. Even if they say it's safe, you don't know if some people are more sensitive to that or if their eyes uh, are more sensitive to that. So I wouldn't do misting during office hours. With regard to hydrogen peroxide misting, the effectiveness of misting, the advantage of misting is that it can disinfect non-porous surfaces like fabrics and uh, well fabrics basically carpeting or whatever if you have carpeting okay so that's the advantage of that uh, so again i wouldn't do it when there are people there uv light yeah sure i mean uv light you have to remember is dependent on two things 
time of exposure and distance of what you're exposing to the UV light itself. So you have to get stuff away from the area you're decontaminating with the UV light so that it is exposed in its entirety for prescribed, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on the intensity of your UV light. There are, you want to get UV within the range of about 240 to 280 because that's where it kills microbes. You also want a UV that probably doesn't generate ozone or too much ozone because it can be quite irritating to the respiratory membranes. So what they recommend is after you decontaminate an area with UV, you let in some fresh air before you start operating because of the ozone generated by some uh, UVGI units. So I, yeah, whatever works for you will, 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 should be fine. So sir, after the UV, you may, maybe you open a window. Is that, is that what you're saying? Next day, the next day, because you, you generally leave a UV disinfectant at the end of the day. You don't, because it can cause eye irritation, conjunctiv keratoconjunctivitis and similar conditions. Okay. So you just leave it there, set the timer an hour, come back the next day, open your windows. That should be good enough. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, I have another question. Um, this is from Alpap. Advantages of wet HV system over dry HV system and the recommended KPA for a single chair or if you have a two chair unit. Oh, you, you'll have to do your research on that. I'm sorry, I'm not a, I'm not a technical <laughs> expert when it comes to suction. Yeah, those things. Wet or dry, I have a wet unit that drains directly into a drain built in. So I'm happy with it. You have less issues with regard to air contamination because your suction unit is in a utility area. So you don't, uh, the dry units have uh, an air exhaust, I think that you need to contend with as well. So you have to find a way to filter that air or at least put it in an area where there are no people, it's not, people are not exposed to it. I mean, both have its uses depending on the facilities that you can use them, use, you can use them in. Sorry about the kilopascals and, you know, I took physics 21 in UP, so. Okay, <laughs> advantage now. Sir, I'm curious also, for the things that you're, for the design of the clinic, um, did you have to, is it recommended that we get like an engineer as a consultant or is that something we dentists can actually do on our own. I, I personally don't think I can do it on my own, but you know, for those that do research, because I have heard of some dentists asking their engineers to visit their offices. It's always good to consult a professional, but remember professional will only give you the advice based on what they've learned in books, but not specific to your profession. Okay, so they might give you advice that's suited for an operating room in a hospital suite or a hospital suite operating room, but might not be applicable to your own setting. So if you seek professional advice for this, you give him inputs as to what exists in your own office. Um, I'm, not, I'm not as you know, tech, tech savvy with regard to engineering protocols as well, but there are there, there's material out there that you can... That's why I said what I showed earlier are, I, I, you know, I was showing the principles behind them. And you have to adapt that situation, the principles, based on what is adaptable in your own setting. But yeah, if you have engineers who are friends who, are, who you can consult with, there's no reason why you, you shouldn't be able to consult with them for their ideas because they can also help you with computing for air exchanges especially, okay, when you have ducting that's longer than usual, if you have a 15, 20 foot ducting system, they can compute for the recommended size of your exhaust fans because the, rec the size of your exhaust fans and, and it's CFM or cubic, I mean, I mean cu cubic meters per hour that it can exhaust air will change dramatically depending on how long your ducting system is. Thank you. Actually, sir, there's a quite a long question about the exhaust fan. Someone asked if you need an industrial size. I mean, if you have that, are you more assured? No, it's noisier for one thing. No, you, you, you get the, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you should compute for this, the volume of your room, length, width, and height. 
and and you know you don't have to compute it if your ceiling is irregular or what just get the average length within height of your room and you you get the specifications from the manufacturer which is usually indicated on a card near the motor or you know and then look at how many air changes an, a minute usually it's going to be per minute and multiply that by 60 because it's going to give you 60 minutes which is an hour and then multiply that by another 8 to 12 depending on how much many air changes you want in an hour by 8 or 10 if you want and then measure the volume of your room the volume of your room times 12 will be the number of air changes an hour which you will need and you get an appropriate sized exhaust fan for that you know? so the smaller the room the smaller the exhaust fan so you don't need a huge exhaust fan for a small room but again huge is relative and smallness is relative okay so you gotta do a little research uh, math. yeah math, just simple math really for that maybe that's why you need the you need the engineer yeah to do yeah. maths for you oh if you're not if you're not too versed in that or you don't want to deal with that and you don't want to deal with computing for the length of ducting because you know, that affects it right? yeah then you just get an engineer to help you out with that yeah sure one a question from dr elmer escoto even with a hepa filter working still wait 15 minutes prior to disinfecting good question uh you can leave the HEPA filter on and probably wait five minutes, but you know, I mean, I guess that recommendation by CDC does not assume that you have a HEPA filter. In fact, they don't even write there that you should have a HEPA filter. They only recommend it as a, an extraordinary measure. So if you have a HEPA filter, maybe the wait period is gonna be shorter, but I, I have no recommendation because that will also depend on the efficiency of your HEPA filter, the amount of time you spent working and all of those things, including airflow of your operatory. A 15 minutes anyway is not a long time. Yeah. Sure, I have a follow up. This is the, supposed to be questions from Zoom. Do you recommend the use of a particulate matter sensor to objectively assess how effective HVE, air filters, and cleaners and EOVs are? Mahal. A good particular. Yeah, a question from me. Uh, yes. Dean Vic. Dean Vic, particulate sensor, I think, is upwards of a hundred thousand bucks. I mean, a good one at least. No, so I don't think it's necessary for you to do that. Uh, you can probably take the word of more reputable uh, manufacturers of uh, your HVEs and your. Uh, what what they do is very simply that if your HVE can suction out a liter of water within a minute, you're probably good. That's pro probably pretty good advice already. Thank you, sir. One from Dr. X. Belmonte. There's an interesting read on pre-symptomatics and asymptomatics. You can take note of that. Okay, Rochelle? Okay. Um, last few questions. What about anecdotal reports that using UVCs may actually cause yellowing of the equipment? Yeah, some plastics do tend to... Because that U UVC really deter makes your materials deteriorate. I mean, you leave something under the sun for a long enough period of time. You're the, the, the car of the dashboard, for example. It used to change color a little bit, right? Uh, so it's the same thing with plastics. So, you know, take out what you don't need there. But if you have to, then it turns yellow, it turns yellow. But I don't think it'll happen right away. So, sure. sir, do you still advocate plastic curtains? Uh, for isolation? Yes. Yeah. I mean, unless you want to make it permanent, then put a drywall partition. But what if you want to, a year from now, this is done? I mean, or uh, you just spray it with some ethanol and wipe it down. That should be good. Replace it if you, I mean, they're cheap, right? The isolation curtains are cheap by the roll. So after three months, you're not tired of doing that, replace the entire thing. I mean, hospitals do it, but it's, it's a temporary measure precisely because you don't want to do a permanent remodeling of your office at this point, no? So if you don't want, uh, someone told me there are polycarbonate panels that are available in hardwares. 
So you can do a frame and polycarbonate wall as well. But again, when that starts to scratch and stain, they, they kind of look ugly already and it's more difficult to replace. If you want and you want, if you want something more permanent, then you do a drywall partition already and do something more permanent at this point before you open. So it's really what you're willing to contend with at this point. But yeah, I, I still use plastic isolation curtains. The reason why, Monica, is simply this. We are not treating COVID patients. Okay, so even if you have aerosols there, the, the, what you're going to contend with there is probably what, staph or strep bacteria because that's the normal flora of the mouth, right? Uh, if you do your proper screening, you treat asymptomatic patients. So now I'm trying to be, you know, a bit of a devil's advocate on the, on the other side of the coin. You know, as I said, tempering our... our you know, panicking expe and expectations. Am I going to assume that there's no COVID on a patient? No, but the chances of you, uh, of a patient shedding that virus, if they're asymptomatic, if you're done, if you've done your screening properly, it's probably very, very low. Sir, and then, this is an FYI. Apparently, there's a Honeywell particulate matter sensor worth 3,300 pesos. Whoa. Okay. So apparently, yeah. yeah. Um, when you have one more question. So hi okay. to choose some Dr. questions. That's why there's so many questions. Um, sir, from Dr. Giorgio Guizon, please comment on the need to disinfect workspace and all surfaces, articles inside isolation area after AGPs. In the same way, someone asked about um, exposing the N95 mask under the sun for four days. Can you comment on that, sir? Okay. Um, four days, <laughs> So I think I think if we if we've been doing disinfection of surfaces ever since the HIV thing we had back in the 80s, all the recommendations, which means that you you want to wipe down pretty much or cover, okay? Either you cover things that you don't you cannot wipe down with a disposable wrap, right? Or you wipe down every exposed surface. If I think the same holds true for this situation. Now, leaving the mask under the sun for four days, there's a problem under the sun, Rochelle? Is it under the sun? Yes, sir. Four days okay. under the sun. Some, some components of the mask may deteriorate, especially the some of the melt-blown components of the mask okay. might deteriorate. Okay, so that's I don't think that's been recommended. What they rec what they've recommended first is the Battelle method of Battelle method of disinfecting, which is very technical. You put the mask, but these are not soiled, okay? These are masks that have been used, but yeah. not heavily contaminated or soiled in a peroxide chamber. And they, spe they use special peroxides for this. Okay, yeah. 30 minutes, and then they, they can reuse it. They can reuse it only as many as three times because it affects the fit as well. Now, some things that have been studied, UV, Decontamination yeah. of the mask, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, That's not the question, yeah. Oh, yeah. UV yeah. decontamination yeah. might work. I don't think there's still a study on that. They say soaking it in three percent peroxide for ten minutes and then drying it out, air drying it uh, does not damage the mask. But again, these masks were never meant to be reused anyway, right? Yes. So yeah. So use them five times. Um, then you get the mileage that you want from it and probably you shouldn't reuse it after three to five times. Or as I said, put a surgical mask over your N95 to preserve it. Thank you, sir. Yep. Sir, it, this is a question. That's good. We're wrapping up, Mon. Your opinion in using plasma filters and scrubbers, as scrubbers. Oh, Air scrubbers. That's the competitor of HEPA filters. And I, I'm, I'm not an engineer, so I, you know, can't comment on the technicalities of the comparison between the two. But let's just say that, let's say NASA uses HEPA filters and carbon activated carbon filters in their uh, space station, shuttles and stuff. They don't use plasma filters. So I guess that speaks a lot about HEPA filtration. Thank you. Sir, we actually have more questions, but we need to wrap it up. Okay. Um, 
we can ask everyone is that any question, can you please email at the UPDA at gmail.com? We make sure that we answer them and then we will reply to you, which is just have to give us time. Would you give, would you mind maybe two more questions just to finish off? Okay. Or from another scene along if there's another topic that got left out that wasn't tackled. Okay, sir, so this is one question that's being yeah. asked, but nobody probably they are asked. Um even patients are asking, so what happens now with the PPEs and with everything they're reading? Are you going to charge more? Well, yeah. I mean, that's why, that's, the short answer is yes. Okay, the long answer is this. That's why I discourage you putting some kind of PPE on your patient. For me, that's uncalled for. You don't need to do that. And I think I've said that in previous webinars. And the reason why you don't have to do that is what are you protecting the patient from uh, in a procedure? That's only added cost and expense to you, which you might, which you reasonably would like to transfer to the patient. So for me, that's now with regard to your PPE. Okay, in this COVID nineteen, what has what has changed from ten years back when we were uh, HIV double gloving in HIV? We don't double glove anymore for, for most procedures, right? We don't. Uh, why? Because we've become complacent. Now suddenly we need to double glove or at least people are double gloving. Okay, and what else? Face shields, we've been using face shields. Or at least you should have been using face shields. What else? I protective eyewear, you should have been using protective eyewear. Masks change, okay? Because now they're recommending respirator masks. So how much is a respirator mask? 100 pesos, 200 pesos, and you don't use it for one patient, right? So you can offset the cost a little bit. What else? Gowns? Well, we've been using disposable gowns. And now that you're using reusable gowns because there are no disposable gowns available, it comes out cheaper actually <laughs> if you transfer it to a patient in terms of cost. Okay, in gowns, I, I also don't recommend coveralls. Why? Because coveralls are difficult to, to, to remove. Imagine if you have three procedures in a span of three hours, you have to doff and don, don and doff coveralls properly. Okay, difficult. So, uh, besides, you don't get infected with droplets ending up on your legs. So, That's true. Right, yeah. Or even on your forehead. So it's you like just wear a and a face shield, right? And you should be fine with, with other gear. So the charging of the patient, you can put a little bit uh, on it, but I think it's unreasonable to charge double to a patient just because you have increased PPE now. Because you should be disinfecting your surfaces anyway with the known bleach is cheap, right? That's why I said use the commonly available disinfectants, which is available in the EPA website, by the way. Okay, that's why I use quaternary ammonium compounds, which is your Lysol. There are many other brands that, that carry the same chemical. You just have to mix it properly and have enough contact time. Perhaps, sir, the consideration is not only about the cost of the material, but perhaps the, um, the efforts needed before and after the procedure. Maybe that's the one they're putting a price on. Or maybe because you're not going to be seeing double booking appointments anymore. That's true. So it's you, fine. yeah. It's but fine. you know, I, I, would you transfer that to a patient because you can't double book appointments? It's true. So maybe your margin will go higher because you can't see as many patients because your volume goes down. Or maybe that's a maybe that's reasonable. But you know, I don't know if your patients will find that reasonable. Also, it's case to case. Thank you, sir. I mean, that's that's a question that. Um, you know, it, people are probably um, embarrassed to ask. But the, if the market can bear it, why not? If the market can bear it, why not? Okay, last question. So, do you still feel that doing AGPs on patients who may exhibit as asymptomatic but are carriers may further push aerosols into the upper respiratory tract? Lower, you mean? I, I think they meant lower respiratory. A lower, okay. Yeah, uh -oh. that's why you don't. That's why I don't recommend an aerosol box, because it concentrates the aerosols on the patient's face. Right? 
So if you're doing procedures, the, the short answer is yes, you might do that. The, the question there becomes, what's your liability? Well, if they're asymptomatic and you screen them well, you really don't have a liability. The only thing that I'm concerned about is if they, they, you didn't do your screening well and then they became symptomatic a few days after visiting your office, then they might say that it came from your office, right? So, but again, you know, that's difficult to answer. Uh, but that's what, that's the reason why I don't use the aerosol box. And if you use your HVE, as I said, it will probably remove 80, 90% of the aerosol. So there's no real reason why it should be driven down into the lower respiratory tract. So I guess, first, yeah. Any advice before we step out there? <laughs> be prepared. Bravely. Yeah, well, be prepared. Remember the hierarchy of controls. Before you invest everything on PPEs, study your workflow, do your screening well, look at your offices, and, and when you're ready, step out. Take it slow. You know, I know, I know a lot of us haven't had work and we need to earn, but if you're slow, take it slow, you'll be able to monitor your flaws and inconsistencies and maybe correct them as well. Thank you, sir. Okay, so, you know, I don't want, uh, you know, that's, that's, about, that's probably the best advice I can give. So with that, th thanks, Rochelle, Monica, Michael, the rest of UPDA, Jonathan, for doing this. Our sponsor, of course, Pasqual Laboratories, uh, who have uh, those mouthwashes that we have actually been recommended, not by us, but by a lot of uh, papers. Thank you for my classmates who are Puyat in the U.S. Andy. Sure. And uh, <laughs> I know they're friends, friends from the college, friends from not from the college who watched this. I thank you very much for, for watching this. And I, you know, as so a last thing, I want to greet my dad who turned, turn, who's actually turning 92 today. Thank you, sir. So thank you very much, sir. And so for our closing remarks. Okay, wrapping up. Thank you to our dependable Dr. Monkan for always unselfishly sharing your time, your insights, and your knowledge for the betterment of the profession. So thank you, Dr. Jonathan Panyalan, our safety net, the one who makes sure that the visuals on your end look good and you don't see the chaotic part that we are that behind the scenes. And thank you to everyone who continues to support the UP Dental Alumni Association and its projects. Um, in behalf of the UP Dental Alumni Association, who endeavor to continuously give you relevant projects, uh, namely doctors Monica Sison Kiambao, Michael Mendoza, Jamie Devera, Jocelyn De Guzman, Elch Barroso, Mark Pilas Pilas, Chris Gonzalez Martinez, Melanie Aquino Serra, our advisors, um, Dr. Junjun Clemente, Dr. Paul De Castro, and Dr. Chico Achaposo de Mata. Thank you. And the good news for those who missed this part of uh, the lecture of the webinar, we will upload it soon on our newly launched YouTube channel called the UP Dental Alumni Association. Thank you, Joe Dix, and thank you, Mark, for putting that up. And those who were um, failed, who missed the trash talk webinar, you can now view it there. You can share it to your peers and your colleagues so we can actually um, share the knowledge. Uh, thank you again for being with us. At mula po sa aming mga tahanan ng UP Dentista para sa bayan, maraming salamat po hanggang sa muli natin pagkikita. Music